Hi my people, hope you're good and happy new year. As today is Auntie Mary's birthday, today's video will be focusing on her life and career. Mary J Blige is an American singer, songwriter and actress, often referred to as the queen of hip hop soul or just simply Auntie Mary because you know, she's everybody's auntie and we will always love her. Whether it's the relatability in her music due to the struggles that she's been through, her down to earth vibe or funny dance moves. She's just really likeable, she's a vibe. She has a very successful career in which she won 9 Grammys, 4 AMAs and 12 Billboard Music Awards amongst many others. Mary has also made a successful transition to both the television and movie screens with supporting roles in films such as Prison Song, I Can Do Battle By Myself and Mudbound for which she earned an Oscar nomination. More recently, she also co-starred as jazz singer Dinah Washington in the Aretha Franklin biopic Respect, as well as Monique Tejada in the popular TV series Power Book 2 Ghost. Hailing from the tough streets of Yonkers, New York, Mary became an icon, but on the inside, she was an emotional wreck, constantly being haunted by her past. She is the living proof that you can overcome trauma and find peace within yourself, no matter how long it takes you. This is Against All Odds, the Mary J. Blige story. Please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. It's your boy Dre Signs. Let's, let's get, it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Mary Jane Blige was born on January 11, 1971 at Fordham Hospital in the Bronx, New York City, to nurse Cora and jazz musician Thomas Blige, who also fought in the Vietnam War and suffered PTSD and alcoholism. She spent her early childhood in Richmond, Georgia, where she sang in a Pentecostal church. Mary has an older sister, Latonia Blige, a younger half-brother, Bruce Miller, and a younger sister, Jean Quayle, both from a relationship Mary's mother had with another man after divorcing her first husband. Her mother always played different artists around the house, from Aretha Franklin, the Staple Singers and Gladys Knight, sparking that sole interest in the young Mary. Mary was a daddy's girl. Her father Thomas taught her how to harmonise and how to hold notes, further strengthening the bond between the two. She discovered a passion for singing and would sing non-stop around the house, often singing in front of the mirror with a brush, mimicking her parents' favourite soul singers. Unfortunately, those good times would come at a screeching stop at a family party in 1976 when Mary was only five years old. A horrifying incident would rob a young Mary of her innocence and change her life forever. When I was five years old, I was molested and just, you know, I remember feeling literally right before it happened, just could not believe this person was going to do this to me. A close family friend had taken advantage of a young Mary, and for a long time she felt ashamed of the situation, refusing to even let her parents know what had happened. But she secretly resented them for not being able to protect her. The thing that sits in my mind is, where were you? Why did you let this happen? How could you let this happen to me? That's the thing that was bothering me. Mary's parents had their own issues and were unhappy in the marriage, causing Mary's father to leave the family in 1979, breaking Mary's heart, who was clearly attached to him. The family barely survived on her mother's earnings as a nurse after that, forcing them to move back to New York and reside in the Schlobaum Housing Projects, located in Yonkers. Unfortunately, things did not get any easier for Mary when she moved back to New York. As a teenager, she went through years of sexual harassment from her peers, which would then lead her to eventually turn to alcohol, drugs and promiscuity to try and numb the pain. Mary recalls her and her best friend often heading down to the pier and just drinking their problems away. Mary dived head first in a life that was heading for destruction, but through it all, music was the one thing in her life, the one positive thing that stuck around. She later decided to drop out of high school in her junior year, not necessarily to pursue a musical career, but because she just didn't like school and was at a rebellious stage, always getting into fights with girls and boys. 
In early 1988, 17-year-old Mary was at the mall with a cousin when they walked past a karaoke machine and was encouraged by a cousin to try it. On it, Mary recorded a cover of Anita Baker's Caught Up in the Rapture in the recording booth. Her mother's boyfriend at the time later played the cassette for Jeff Red, a recording artist and A&R runner for Uptown Records. Jeff then sent it to the president and CEO of the label, Andre Arell. Andre was impressed with Mary's vocals and how she was able to make it her own song by adding her own little twist to it. Andre reached out to Mary's mother and they scheduled a meeting at her house. Andre pulled up in a black beamer wearing sunglasses, blue trousers and white Gucci loafers, looking like money in a rundown neighborhood in the projects. Once he made it inside Mary's living room, he asked Mary to sing right then and there on the spot, in front of him, the mother and everyone else. With little to no effort, Mary pulled it off and impressed Andre who signed her to Uptown Records on the spot. She became the company's youngest and first female artist. Andre recalls telling Mary in a living room that one day she would sing for kings and queens of the world. Now signed to Uptown Records, Mary didn't release anything straight away. This is because the label executives had a hard time creating a brand and didn't exactly know what to do with her. Mary didn't want to be another Whitney Houston or Mariah Carey. She was full on street and hood and wanted to stick to that flavor. Luckily, a 19 year old intern at the label knew exactly what to do with her. That was P Diddy. He figured that trying to make Mary glamorous would be a wrong move. So he got his then girlfriend, stylist Misa Hilton to link up with Mary and become her stylist. And with that, Mary found her new look. And her and Misa became like sisters ever since, being very close to this day. Combining her powerful voice with a raw hip hop feel, Diddy and Mary would create a unique sound, which would become her debut album, What's the 411, released in 1992. The album was a success, going double platinum, fueled by its second single, Real Love, which is in my three top favorite Mary J. Blige songs. The song was a massive hit and shot straight to number one in the R&B charts. What's the 411 also peaked at number six on the Billboard 200. My favorite songs from the album are Reminisce, You Remind Me, Real Love, Love No Limit and Slow Down. Top tier songs. With the album, she was dubbed the reigning queen of hip hop soul. The album's success spun off What's the 411 Remix. A remix album released in December of 1993 that was used to extend the life of What's the 411 singles on the radio into 1994 as Mary recorded her follow up album. After the success of the first album and her songs being on radio, the checks finally started rolling in and Mary J Blige was finally able to move her family out of the slow bomb projects and into the suburbs in New Jersey. Mary was over the moon as it was always her goal to move her family out of the hood. The success however was bittersweet as in winter of 1992, Mary would enter a fiery and toxic relationship with Casey from the R&B group Jodeci who were also signed to Uptown. The couple brought the best and worst in each other. Andre Harrell recalls a time at a Mary J Blige concert where Casey came out to perform a duo with Mary, but Casey was doing what Casey does and that was getting all the girls excited with his seductive moves on stage and that really annoyed Mary. When it came time for the intermission, the two had a big argument backstage where apparently tables and bottles were being thrown and flipped. I really liked him and when I like you, I like you. I just fell in love with him. And I was in a relationship where we were both young, both super successful. I loved him, you know, but neither one of us could handle the success of our lives. So it became very um, dark, the whole thing, and abusive. The two were emotionally and physically abusive to each other. Impaired with Mary's inability to cope with the pressures of fame, she started using again. 
more specifically cocaine and alcohol, which sent her into a downward spiral. The fact that Mary has always been a bit of an introvert made it harder and scarier for her to be catapulted into stardom so quickly, so she turned to drugs and alcohol to make her feel comfortable. She was then diagnosed with clinical depression. In late 1993, Mary J and Puffy confided in each other as both of them were dealing with their own relationship problems at the time. It was then that Puffy encouraged Mary to channel her pain into her music. And that's when the work on her second album, My Life, began. On November 29, 1994, Uptown MCA released My Life to positive reviews. The album peaked at number 7 on the US Billboard 200 and number 1 on the top R&B Hip Hop Albums chart, selling 481,000 copies in its first week and remaining atop of the R&B Hip Hop Albums chart for an unprecedented 8 weeks. It ultimately spent 46 weeks on the Billboard 200 and 84 weeks on the top R&B Hip Hop Albums chart. It is a fan favourite because of how personal the album is and how many people could relate to it. In contrast to a previous album, What's the 411, this album is actually a lot deeper and less party-like. This album got some bops in it too like Be Happy, Mary Jane, My Life and I'm Going Down. Through it all, Mary was still in a relationship with Casey because when you're in love and you have all your friends telling you, ah, oh, this guy's not good for you, you should leave him, it's hard to listen and to break away from that person. Unfortunately though, one fateful night in 1995, during an interview on the UK television show The Word, the hosts asked Mary about her relationship with Casey. Mary confirmed that her and Casey were engaged. So these messy hosts played her an interview they had with Casey a few weeks earlier in which he denied that they were getting married, completely catching a visibly upset Mary off guard. Let's have a look. Right. And if you're trying to do something? Yeah. I have to ask this really quickly. Uh, Jodie Sue were on the show uh, earlier on in the series and uh, Terry asked Casey this question. Have a look at this. Now you're going to break a few hearts because uh, I've heard that you're going to marry Mary J. Blige, aren't you? No! You know what I'm saying? That's a rumor for the states too, you know. Casey is not getting married. For the now, is it, was he being super cool or what? Are you getting married? No, we're not getting married. I was just going to say, I'm very glad no, to hear that, No, we're not getting married. We're not getting married now. <laughs> not married now? <laughs> so there's no huge engagement ring? Oh, the, yeah. Whatever. Let's Whatever. move on, please. Okay. I'm but now, disgusting. Well, uh, last Poor Mary, man. And these messy reporters were loving it. They live for this kind of messiness. At this point, Mary's sister was practically begging her to leave him because of the embarrassment he was causing her. And even then, the couple was still on and off. After a few more years though, she was finally able to find the strength to leave him. And the two went their separate ways. By 1996, Mary was working on the next album. At this time though, her relationship with Diddy was non-existent. In 1993, Diddy was fired from Uptown and started his own record label, Bad Boy Records, and quickly signed a then unknown Faith Evans as the first lady of Bad Boy. According to Mary, Diddy was molding Faith Evans after her, and Mary did not appreciate that at all. There's only one Mary J. Blige. I don't know, can run out and get how many girl groups and turn their hat backwards and fix their hair like mine, but they'll never be me because I'm just me and I don't act out Mary. This is Mary every day. For this reason, Mary and Faith always had some kind of tension between them, which was made even worse when the whole Lil' Kim, Faith Evans and Biggie Love Triangle started because Mary is close friends with Lil' Kim. She also felt like once Diddy started developing Faith, he grew distant from her, causing Mary's feelings to get hurt. During the making and run of the second album, My Life, Mary experienced clinical depression while also battling drug and alcohol addiction, as mentioned before, all of which heavily influenced the dark mood of that album. In late 1996, however, Mary made an effort to clean up her life, quit alcohol and drugs and subsequently found herself in a more positive frame of mind while recording Share My World which influenced the album's noticeably lighter mood. 
Share My World was released in April of 1997. The album debuted at number one on both the US Billboard 200 and R&B albums chart, with sales of 240,000 copies in its first week, marking Mary's first official number one album on the Billboard 200 chart. The album would eventually go on to be certified five times platinum, becoming her best-selling album to date. The album spawned five singles, Love Is All We Need featuring Nas, I Can Love You featuring Lil' Kim, a banger by the way, Everything, another banger, Missing You and Seven Days. Things were looking up for Mary, but unfortunately, the pattern of things going up and down for her seemed to have followed her once again. In 1998, while on tour for the Share My World album, Mary would see an unexpected face in Detroit. Her father's. For the first time in almost 20 years, Thomas Blige reached out to Mary when he heard that she was on tour and would stop in Detroit for a show, which is where he now resides. But instead of asking her for forgiveness, this man asked her for money. Like, can you believe it? 20 years she didn't see his face and the first thing he asked for is money. That's crazy. No explanation or anything. Just, I need money. Mary understandably screamed at him and stormed off. That encounter led Mary back to numbing her pain the only way she knew how. Drugs and alcohol. This time, the abuse was much worse, to the point where she wouldn't sleep for days and started hallucinating. One night in her hotel room, Mary came face to face with death when she had gone too far with the drinking. The problem has snowballed into this thing that was bigger than me. It was bigger than me. And I, it was definitely going to kill me. So I was like, all right, let's, <laughs> this is it, then let's go. And I remember sitting on my bed. I, 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 I swear, I don't know what death feels like, but I, I felt like my spirit was trying to leave my body. And I was crying and I was going, please, God, no, no. Not, not now, I'm not, I don't want this. I would prayed, like, like I remember saying a prayer, God, send me someone to help me. While Mary was going through this depressing and scary moment, her phone rang just by chance. It was Ken Do Isaacs on the other line, a music manager and record producer she had met a few weeks earlier. Mary and Ken Do first met through Queen Latifah, Mary thought he was cute but left him alone because she thought something was going on between him and Queen Latifah. <laughs> but little did she know, he was feeling her too and was aware of a drinking problem. Once Mary picked up the phone, they had a deep conversation about her struggles and she confided in him. In return, he offered some very good advice, almost like a therapist. He would challenge her and ask her, why do you drink? Mary would say, because I hate myself. And he would be like, why do you hate yourself? And she would answer and he would question her again and again and so on, eventually making her realize why she was partaking in this destructive behavior. She just needed someone to level with her. Kendu told her that together they're going to start the healing process because she had been healing incorrectly. Mary now had someone on her side who seemingly cared for her. Things started to take a turn for the better. In that same year, Mary would begin work on her next album, simply titled Mary, which would then release the year later in 1999. As Mary entered the 2000s, her relationship with Kendu Isaacs gradually became more serious and with abstaining from alcohol and drugs, Mary became more confident in herself, deciding to let go of her past. This sentiment was reflected on her next album, No More Drama, released in August of 2001. The album's first single, Family Affair, produced by Dr. Dre, became her first number one single on the Billboard Hot 100, where it remained for six consecutive weeks. The single to follow was No More Drama, another classic song from the album. No More Drama debuted at number 2 on the US Billboard 200 and at number 1 on the R&B Albums chart, selling 294,000 copies in its first week. 
The album also received two Grammy Award nominations for Best R&B Album and Best Female R&B Vocal Performance. As Mary got back on her feet and was now in higher spirits, Kendu asked her the question she had been waiting for almost her whole life. He said, will you marry me? Uh, and I, yes, you, absolutely I will marry you. I never felt safe before. And obviously he felt he had found the love of his life because men don't ask you to marry them. Like not a woman like me with the past that I have. He also became a manager. Shortly after the two got engaged, Kendu had a surprise for Mary, one that could either F up her day or further heal up her wounds. Kendu tracked down and brought Mary's father to her, who apologized and asked for Mary's forgiveness. This time, Mary fell in his arms, crying, just overwhelmed by the emotions. I fell in this man's arm like I did when I was a little kid. Like, I rested my head on his chest started breathing again. I started feeling like a little kid again, like the hardness was leaving me for him. But I actually started feeling better, you know, and then the reconciliation came after the forgiveness. As Mary reconciled with her father, she would also reconcile with Diddy, and the two began working on a sixth studio album, Love and Life. The album was a success, debuting at number one on the Billboard 200 and spawning one of my favorite Mary J. Blige singles. Love at First Sight, featuring Method Man. 2003 was a good year for Mary, so it was only right to close the year with a wedding when she would marry Kendu on the 7th of December 2003. Mary wanted the wedding to take place in her house, to be small with only family and friends present. The wedding was really close-knit, with only 15 people present, which speaks to how Mary lives her life, in a tight circle. In 2004, after doing a lot of inner work, Mary finally found the strength to forgive the man that S. Hader back in 1976. She hasn't seen the man ever since, but she had to forgive him just so she could move on. Because why should she have to carry the burden of the mess that he did? That's his demons, not hers. Now being at peace with him, Mary was finally able to confess to her mom what happened on that fateful day back in 1976 when she was just a child. Mary was scared to tell her mom because she knew that she would have gone to prison. Her mom would have killed that man. Her mom obviously did not take the news very well and she cried out of guilt before angrily asking Mary why she didn't tell her about it back then. But after a deep conversation, Mary was able to get her mom to calm down and get past it. They then embraced and that chapter in Mary's life was finally closed for good. Two thousand and five was definitely Mary's year, as in that year she released her biggest album to date, The Breakthrough. The album debuted at number one on both the US Billboard 200 and Top R&B Hip Hop Albums chart, selling seven hundred and twenty-seven thousand copies in its first week. It became the biggest first week sales for an R&B solo female artist in SoundScan history. The album spawned one of her most successful singles. Be Without You, which became a smash hit almost immediately. The album would eventually go three times platinum and win her three Grammys. With all the fighting she has done in her personal life and career up to that point, it seemed like her hard work finally paid off and it permanently solidified her name in the industry. All of that didn't slow her down at all though, as over the next four years she would release two more albums and finally get the opportunity of a lifetime. Tomorrow. 
As Andre predicted back in 1989, it was time for Mary to sing for Kings and Queens. As in January of 2009, Mary sang at the presidential inauguration for Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama. The little girl that used to sing in her living room in the broken down projects of Slobom was now standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial singing for the president. This moment showed a lot of people from poor areas that anyone with a talent that takes their craft seriously can end up doing big things in life. Not only from Mary's side, but from Obama's side as well. Here are two individuals from poor areas now at the height of their achievements. What a sight to see. Throughout the 2010s and 2020s, Mary's work in music and film continued, with the release of six more albums, more notably My Life 2, Strength of a Woman and Good Morning Gorgeous. In 2017, Mary starred in the period drama film Mudbound, directed by Dee Rees, playing Florence Jackson. Her role in the movie was praised by critics and with good reason I really enjoyed the film and her acting was believable. However, in the midst of all this, more drama struck Mary once again. Unfortunately, as Mary was keeping busy with work, her marriage would go down the drain, when in 2016 she would file for divorce from Kendu, citing irreconcilable differences. However, the rumour was that he cheated on her and was verbally abusive to her. The court documents showed that Kendu was allegedly using Mary's money to spend on his new girlfriend. The audacity on this man. And to add insult to injury, the court had ruled that because she earns more money than him, she had to pay him temporary spousal support of $130,000 per month. Sheesh! The divorce was finalised in 2018. And though Maria stated that she is open for love still, she also stated that marriage is not in the cards for her anytime soon. I don't blame her. Anyway, she continued her acting career. In 2020, Mary played a leading role in the horror film Body Cam. Mary also currently stars as Monate Tahada in Power Book 2 Ghost, the first spin-off for the highly rated stars drama Power, which premiered in September of 2020. On February 13th, 2022, Mary performed at the Super Bowl halftime show alongside Dr. Dre, Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, Snoop Dogg and 50 Cent. I proper, proper enjoyed that whole show from start to finish. The production, the music, absolutely 10 out of 10. It took me all the way back because I grew up with these artists. Called the Queen of Hip Hop Soul, Mary is credited with influencing the musical marriage of hip hop and R&B. African American scholars have noted the implications of Mary's presentation and representation of black womanhood and femininity in the typically male dominated genre of hip hop. Mary J. Blige is credited with articulating black women's experiences in a more factual and objective manner than those that came before her. She would tell you what's going on in her life, straight to your face. No hidden meanings, no lyrics to decipher, just straight and direct. Many notable artists named Mary J. Blige and her work as an influencer to their art, such as Beyonce, Adele, Summer Walker, Tiana Taylor, Taylor Swift, and even Sam Smith, whom she worked with in the past. I'm not a big fan of Sam Smith, but that's besides the point. She continues to speak to the masses through her music about loving yourself. She empowers women to continue to push when faced with adversity and overcome trauma. She presents herself as a living testament of that. We at Throwback Central wish Auntie Mary all the best and hope that she continues to win against all odds. Because you can't hold a good woman down.
Thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. I'll catch you on the next one. It's your boy Dre Signs, over and out. Peace. Yeah.